go to Luke 8. So I hope everyone had a good time yesterday. Thanks everyone for, for coming. I, I, I enjoyed it too. Um, one thing I was thinking as well, because you know, like I like to do these sort of slideshows every year, just so we can you know, remember what happened in the last year. But um, I need your help to get more photos. I feel like I didn't really have that many photos. But because you know, I always keep the camera in the box. So, you know, whenever you want, you can always just grab the camera, take photos. You know, if you take photos on your phone um, at church events or, you know, with people from church, uh, send them to me at least when I have them all. And then when I go through the photos for the year, I'll have uh, more photos to choose from uh, to put into the slideshow each year. Uh, but I think it's really, I think it's really cool to look, just look at, you know, put this slideshow together because we can be encouraged by the things obviously we accomplish with God's help uh, through the year. But uh, what I want to preach about today is because when I, when I look at the slideshow and I look at the, just remembering what we did last year, because in the slideshow we see, oftentimes we see in the photos, we see, you know, the people that were involved in things, right? And the people that have joined us, I guess the people that were involved and the people that weren't involved in certain events. Um, the people that have like joined us that year, you know, we've had families join us this year. Uh, and the people that are unfortunately no longer with us or they, you know, they are rarely with us and, you know, and it's evident in the photos sometimes because we know about them, but then they're not in a lot of the photos. So I guess the question I want to talk about today is I want to preach on the parable of the sower. And I want to challenge you guys because I, I want you to think about, you know, where are you going to be next year? You know, like when we're celebrating the church anniversary next year, you know, what are you going to accomplish for God? You know, what are you, are you going to be in the slideshow? You know, like when you look back, when, we, when we're sitting, hopefully, I don't know if we'll be in this building or in another building, when we're watching the video and you're thinking back of the things that this church accomplished for Jesus Christ, what is going to be the, your story in that and, and, and in the work that we do here? And, and that's why I think about the parable of the soul because, you know, when we think about being fruitful, we think about doing things, and the parable of the soul really talks about, you know, the reasons why people are and aren't, or it talks more about why people are not uh, fruitful for the Lord. So let's just read here in Luke 8, uh, verse 4. And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. So I'm going to be pre pretty much preaching out of this passage today and not really going to much other passages. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit and hundredfold. So we know in the other parables we have 30, 60, 100. In this one it just mentions the hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, <coughs> let him hear. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this, The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. And that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart having heard the word keep it and bring forth fruit, fruit with patience. And we just ended there. So this is a very fam familiar parable. I've preached on it before but um, you know that was a long time ago. But uh, we're all very familiar with the, with the parable, but just a, just a brief synopsis of what's happening. Here. Basically, Jesus explains a parable of a sower, and the sower goes out to seed, and he gives four scenarios. The first scenario is the seed that falls by the wayside, and the birds come and eat it. And then there's three other scenarios where the seed is actually received into the ground. And one is when it falls upon a rock, and then, you know, the, you know it doesn't have enough. In this parable, it says it doesn't have enough moisture, it lacked moisture, whereas other times it says the sun came up. But they're kind of related, right? The sun comes up, and because it didn't have enough moisture, it um, went away and didn't bear any fruit. This, uh, the third scenario is when the seed falls among thorns, and then it doesn't bear fruit. Why? Because the thorns choke, um, uh, choke that word, and it becomes unfruitful. And then the last scenario is when it falls on the good ground, 
and it springs up and it bears fruit. And this obviously describes the different scenarios there are later on. Because Jesus actually in here, in, with the parable of the soul, he actually goes on to explain what the parable means. So there's a lot of parables that are not accompanied by an explanation and people can dispute over what the parable represents. But when it comes to the parable of the sower, there's no real dispute over what the parable represents because Jesus himself goes on to explain what the parable is. So there's no question about what the seed is. There's no question about what the ground is. You know, the seed is received into the heart. Um, and then there's no question about what the three different scenarios or the four different scenarios mean. So we're just going to go through those. And I know they're very familiar to us, but just I want to remind you today to be the good ground, you know, to not be the, the seed that, for, obviously you don't want to be the seed that falls by the wayside. You need to get saved, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. But you don't want to be the, the hearer with the heart where the seed falls among the, you know, the rock, right? And the, and the seed falling among the thorns. We want to be those where the seed falls among uh, the good ground and have a good and honest heart as the scripture says here. So let's first talk about those that fall by the wayside. It says, those that by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh the, the way the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Now there's always a, a lot of dispute over which scenarios uh, are saved and which aren't. And those that sort of teach a works-based salvation, they like to say that the first three scenarios are people that are not saved, and then the last scenario is the only one that's saved, because that's the one that had works and had fruit. But we see here in the parable of the sower in Luke, it makes it very clear that, you know, the devil comes and takes that word out of their heart. So you can see that when somebody hears the word, it is in their heart, but then they haven't actually believed it. They haven't actually received it. Because it says here, lest they should believe it, believe and be saved. So it's the words taken away, then they don't believe. Because if they did believe, they would be saved. And then we go on to the second scenario. We can see that from then on, these are people that are saved because it says here in the second part of uh, verse 13, which for a while believe. So they have believed. They believed, they received the word, they have eternal life, um, but obviously they, they aren't fruitful in the second and third examples. Uh, and in the fourth example is the ideal scenario when they are fruitful. So I think this is why I wanted to sort of uh, go from this passage because I think the parable of Luke makes it very clear that the first scenario is the only scenario where people are not saved. Now, why don't they believe or understand? Well, it says here, because then cometh the devil. So the birds of the air eating that seed by the wayside, they are representing Satan, right? Satan coming and taking that word out that was sown in their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Now, I don't believe Satan has the ability to control our thoughts. So he, he doesn't, I don't think he's directly just going into somebody's heart and just, you know, making them forget. But the way I think he does it is he injects lies into the world, right? He has his philosophies out there where, you know, he injects his philosophies and his information through the media, through the internet, through the TV, through his movies, through his music. You know, he runs that industry. You know, it's very hard for people that are godly and have the truth to get into that industry, right? Because it's controlled by wicked people, often people who worship Satan and are in the occult. And that's why they're able to, to get so popular because they're able to get the funding from all the people that, that have that money, that they're just the wicked people in this world. And, you know, sometimes I'm so amazed by the things that people believe, you know, the one that they watch on TV, just because it's called a documentary, they just believe it. And I'll just give you two examples. And hopefully, you know, when you watch these things, you just don't believe everything you hear. But one example is when you watch a documentary on dinosaurs, right? And, you know, they have a documentary on dinosaurs. You, walk, you know, you watch this documentary on dinosaurs and then they, they, they know how the dinosaur sounds. I didn't know that they knew, I didn't know bones, you know, knew, you know, knew what a T-Rex sounded like or a brontosaurus sounded like. They, and they know the migration patterns. They know that, you know, they move in herds and, where, and, and what they ate and all this sort of stuff. And obviously, you know, but see, I get that there is, you know, they're guessing based on the bone structure and where the bones are buried, but, but they, don't, they don't teach it like that's their guess. They teach it like it's truth. And somebody just watching that document, they, they think they know everything about dinosaurs, but then they don't realize that the person just, they dug up some bones and then they're just guessing like all these migration patterns because, oh, they found some bones here and they found some bones here. But it's like newsflash, that's just where they died. That doesn't mean that's, that's where they lived. And, you know, and if there was a flood, you know, it could have washed them all over the place. So, 
It's just uh, things like that. And the other, you know, the other one that people just believe when they watch these documentaries, you know, you talk to your unsaved family, friends, and colleagues, it's when they watch documentaries about space, explore, space exploration, right? And when they, and they watch this documentary flying through space, like they know what this distant planet looks like and this distant star looks like, and they know what the galaxy looks like. Yeah, because they've been out there, right, to take a picture of the galaxy, to tell us what it looks like. So there's no way they try, and you know, and that's why I'm always so disappointed when I go to like an absor observatory because, you know, before when I used to think, oh, you know, these guys are taking pictures of these planets, and taking pictures of these stars, and you, and you get these experts come on these documentaries and they talk about, oh, you know, there's, there's abundance of, you know, hydrogen on this moon and an abundance, and then you go to the observatory, I don't know if you guys have been to observatories, and then they, they point it into the night sky, right, and they say, oh, look, look into, and, and what do you see? You see a bunch of dots of light, right? And you're just, you're just like, is that, is that all you can see when you're, making, <laughs> when you're making these documentaries and everything? Is that all they can see? Like, they're just seeing dots of light. So they're, 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 what they're trying to, trying to guess, right? What this planet or what this, 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 this moon or they think is a moon, what they're, what they're basing it really on is just the color of the light. You know, because that's all they can see. That's all they can see from the earth. Do you know what I mean? So... Like I said, that's why I don't think Satan really just can make people forget things, but he just, he just injects lies out there. And if you are not a thinking person and thinking, what do pe what, how, how are they coming up with this information? How are they actually determining these things? You're just going to believe the lies. And, you know, and, and, and it's the same when it comes to spiritual things. You know, you watch a documentary, you know, The Da Vinci Code. How many people were, you know, fooled by that one? And now they just think, oh, you know, there's this cover up and everything. Um, you know, when, when they actually find out, well, that's, you know, you actually look where the manuscripts come from, where they're dated and everything, and it's like, no, this is, this is a complete lie. Anyways, I won't go on more about that, but I just wanted to make the point that, you know, it's, it's just amazing the things that people believe um, just because they watch some documentary, they watch it on TV. <coughs> now, let's go on to the second scenario. The second scenario is um, the one that uh, falls on the rock. So they on the rock, are they which when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. So I already talked about this scenario representing a saved believer. And this is when somebody might fall away from the faith, right? They might either quit church or just get away from God um, because of, you know, temptation or persecution, you know, when they go through hard times. And here in the parable further up, it says, remember what we talked about, it says it lacked moisture, right? Uh, go? Sprang up. It withered away because it lacked moisture. And we go down here. Why did it lack moisture? Because it says here, these have no root. So if you think about what this is representing, when it says it's on the rock, there's no root, it's because the person didn't really dig deep to understand what they believe, why they believe it. That's why when they go through trouble, they fall away from the faith because the roots didn't go deep enough to actually get the water so that in the other parables, when the sun comes out, the tribulation and persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by they are offended. Now, physical persecution where we're, we're actually, you know, either beaten or taken away to jail or, you know, we're actually like, you know, fear for our life. That's not something we really experience in Australia, is it? No. I mean, it's, you know, if you, if you think you're suffering persecution, you need to take a reality check, yeah. you know, that you think you're suffering persecution. But, you know, I guess what we do sort of suffer from in, in Australia is it's more the social persecution, isn't it? And maybe that's more effective in a country like Australia where people are a bit more proud, they're a bit more caring about what people think about them. They don't want to be the one that's different at work. They don't want to be the one that's different among their family. They don't want to take the stand amongst their friends and their family, amongst colleagues and things. And the devil probably realizes this. And that's why maybe that's the tactic he takes in Western countries where he's just making it unpopular to stand for the truth. Um, you know, he'd rather just silence Christians by ridiculing them rather than harming them. And if we give in to that, if we're so proud, if we don't want to take a stand for God, it's going to work, right? Where we just keep our mouth silent, you know, where we are, and we don't let people know what we believe. Uh, obviously, we try and do it in, in the best way possible, the most effective way possible, possible. But, you know, other people, you know, they fall away from the faith and they can't take the persecution, they can't take, uh, you know, maybe either the social ridicule. ridicule. Um, some of the reasons might be, you know, maybe they've bought into this whole 
you know, prosperity gospel lie in the sense that if you're a believer, then your life's just going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise, and you're going to be popular, and everything's going to be great for you. Uh, and if you uh, buy into that lie, then obviously when times get a little bit tough, you might fall away from the faith. You might think, you know, because you believe this lie that just because you're a believer, that life is going to be smooth sailing. But you don't have to read very far into the Bible to know that, you know, yea, and all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I mean, Jesus didn't live, uh, you know, an easy life. The apostles, that were a lot of them were, were martyred. You know, you read throughout, you don't have to read very far through Acts. You know, it's just, you know, they're breaking out of jail. They're, you know, they're being persecuted. And even when you read through the epistles, I mean, Paul is writing some of these from jail. So, you know, if, the, if one of the greatest apostles, Paul, is having a hard time who do we think we're, we're gonna have a life better than that you know so yeah we're blessed in the sense that we get a bit of an easier life thank god but if it's expected of you hey well you know maybe god needs to bring some persecution to us so that you know we we um realize how good we've got it but sometimes people you know they just can't handle the ridicule you know in in terms of the things that we believe because they don't understand why it's more reasonable see if you are a believer and you don't really know what you believe and somebody might say to you oh you know you believe in some imaginary man in the sky you know he's making all things making all the rules ha 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 they think they're so smart somebody who is not rooted in their faith they may get a little bit offended and think oh, i believe something silly as opposed to being rooted in their faith and thinking, well, yeah, well, you know, I believe that something created everything rather than nothing creating everything. You know, I mean, isn't that even more foolish to just think nothing? I mean, I can at least, you know, when I talk to people out soul winning, it's like, hey, I can at least look at the world and see, you know, if a car is made, somebody made that. If a book is written, somebody, you know, at least my belief is based on some sort of rational observation, but then the atheist believes that nothing created everything. I mean, there's no example of that at all. And, and you know, this is what I mean. Like, people have to know what they believe, how to defend their faith, so that when you come across persecution, you don't lack the moisture, right? You don't, you, you have your roots deep. You know, people might say, oh, you believe in a global flood, and they laugh about that, like, you know, well, obviously the global flood was a miracle, but it's, it's no laughing matter. It's funny how, you know, even they can see, they can see, uh, you know, the, the rock layers and, and the, you know, the, the, what do they call it? The, um, uh, no, it's the uh, erosion. Right? So the, yeah, the strata, the rock layers, but also the, the water erosion, right? How do you explain like sea creature fossils in the tops of mountains? How do you explain like, you know, the polystrate fossils of tree trunks in these layers, right? And they're just like stripped bare and they're just like standing upright. Yeah, because you know, these rock layers are laid down by millions of years, they tell you, right? Because a tree just stands there, a bare trunk just stands upright for millions of years, just waiting to be buried, right? <laughs> And so, you know, if you think about it, if you know these things, and you know, like, what you believe is not stupid, it's actually the world believes something stupid. But, you know, we need to be able to lovingly explain this to them and say, hey, you know, this is not actually unreasonable. It's actually your position that's unreasonable. You've got to think about these things. It's the same with the resurrection. People, people laugh about, oh, you know, you believe that Jesus rose from the dead. But even the facts surrounding that make it, make it hard not to believe. I mean, you have a guy, think about this, right? Even if you don't believe, you know, somebody doesn't believe Jesus is the Son of God or well, doesn't believe he rose from the dead. I mean, you have a man who was a public figure back then, right? The Gospels are written. There's names of people and, and you know, governors, the high priests in the Gospel. You have somebody that's publicly known to be preaching that he was the Son of God, and then he dies on the cross, right? And, and then after his body can't be found, and then all his apostles are willing to risk their life proclaiming that he rose from the dead. Now, if he didn't write, because people say, oh, yeah, well, cult leaders, right? They, they, they dupe people into um, thinking that they're the Messiah all the time. Yeah, they do, but they never dupe anyone into real, like being crucified. And then, and then after they're crucified, duping them into believing that they rose from the dead. Do you see the difference? So people are saying like, oh, yeah, Jesus, it's just like any other cult leader where the cult leader just, you know, you can get people to drink Kool-Aid and then, you know, poison Kool-Aid and then they all die. Yeah, but this is a little bit different when you're publicly crucified, your body can't be found, and then the apostles are willing to risk their life saying that he resurrected. And not only the apostles, but people that were contrary to Jesus. You know, like Saul, he was killing Christians, right? So you've got the enemy, and then you've got his brothers, his half-brothers that didn't believe on him. They then become believers preaching the gospel. So it's a very, very different scenario to the scenario that people are painting. Um, to believe in 
the resurrection. Um, yeah, I was going to say something else, but I, I can't remember now. I lost my train of thought. But uh, what was I, I going to say about the resurrection? Anyways, sorry, I forgot that, I forgot that thought. But like I said, it, it's, it's, it's not unreasonable at all. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Um, because, you know, people say it's like unreason unreasonable to believe it. And some people will say things like, oh, yeah, well, he didn't really die on the cross. Like, he didn't really die on the cross. I can't remember what it's called. Like, is it the swoon theory or something where he didn't actually die on the cross and they, they buried him, and then, but he wasn't actually dead. So that's, that's why he supposedly rose again from the dead because he just was sort of resuscitated. He revived, right, because he wasn't actually dead. And then, he's, then everyone thought he rose from the dead, right, because he didn't actually die on the cross. But just think about how silly this is, right? Because if, if somebody's just crucified on the cross, right, they crucify. Somehow they survived that. They survived because his legs wasn't broken. They wrap him up, they bury him. And let's say in the tomb, right, he, he somehow didn't die, right? He was still actually alive. They just thought he was dead. But then somehow he, he unwrapped himself and then somehow he, he rolled away the stone to get out of there. And he, now, because he's, he's, not, he's not resurrected in a new body, right? He's, he's, he's beaten, he's pierced, he's got nails. To, then he goes to his disciples and go, go preach the gospel, right? Because I've risen from the dead. If you were an apostle, you'd think you're crazy. Like, you know, because you're obviously a con man. No, but see, he's not a con man because, you know, they saw the risen Jesus. That's why they were willing to risk their life. So same thing with Jesus. You know, like, pe like people, like they try and, you know, I talk to people, they try and just make Jesus out to just, they, they liken him to a cult leader. And you're just like, wait, this is, that's total misrepresentation. You know of 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 it, and a lot of them, a lot of them don't even won't even uh, you know dare say that Jesus was a deceiver, because most of them at least believe he's a good teacher. But it's like, well, if you believe he's a good teacher, why don't you believe what he taught? You know, you don't believe what he taught. Anyway, so we need to know what we believe. You know, we need to be able to give an answer to everyone for the hope that's in us, so that you know we can face this ridicule, right, and change people's mind. Then they'll think twice next time when they try and ridicule Christians, because it's like, hey, well, this. Because I don't know if you ever had that scenario happen to you before where you might know somebody. This actually happened to me. And so I'm probably going to be preaching longer than I thought. But this happened to me in Arizona, right, where I actually ended up getting my boss, my manager saved. Because he was like talking about Christian, like, you know, the Bible and stuff and ridiculing it. And, and I, it, was on, it was on shift, right? And I won't tell you the whole story, but the, the, the short of it is he was, we were talking about it and he was ridiculing the Bible. And then I sort of stood up to it and said, no, no, like this. And, we were talking, and I was like, no, this is reasonable, this and this and this. Anyways, later on, when I was talking to him, we were walking and talking about the gospel and stuff, he actually, he actually ended up asking me about the gospel and why I'm a Christian and things like that. And he actually shared with me that, the, you know, the reason why he took an interest is because you know, he, he's, he's always ridiculed the Bible. He's always said these things, but this is the first time somebody's actually stood up to it and actually like gave him a response and that sort of took him aback. So anyways, after a while, I ended up getting him saved. I was just so shocked because like once we were walking through the, we were walking through the warehouse, right? And I was, I was telling him the gospel and then we walk upstairs to, he's, he's locking up the meeting room and then he just turns to me and we're in the meeting room and he's like, he goes, he goes to so save me. How do I get saved? <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, and then I say, and then I, and we ended up praying together and he got saved. So that was, that was the weirdest thing. Like I had no idea it was going to lead to that because I just was so shocked when he stopped me and then um, asked how to be saved. Um, anyways, uh, that, 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 was, that was a crazy story. So let's go on to the next one. So let's go on to thorns. <clears throat> so I think for us in this room, when it comes to being on the rock, it's really that ridicule and understand, because we don't really go through persecution. I think for us in this room, it's really the one that is on the thorny ground. That's the one that we have to be aware of, right? Because we live in a country, we are in a situation, we are very prosperous people, right? There's a lot of thorns out there, right? And if there's a lot of thorns out there, we need to be aware that we don't have a thorny heart where we are taken away with the things that this parable mentions. It says, um, let's go here. But they, but th and that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. 
Now, you, you, you just reading this are probably already thinking of, of examples in your own life that fit into these categories. You know, that's the Holy Ghost speaking to you. Right? If you know that there is a thorn in your life that is taking you away from being fruitful for the Lord, God is trying to get your attention. Right? But what does he mention here? Cares. You know, when we're so worried about things all the time, we're worried about you know, when it may be riches, you know, because we spent our life chasing riches, trying to amass this wealth, trying to amass all these things. Now we're worried about losing them. Right? We, we, and, and we have all these cares of this world and things that we're worried about. And what about pleasures of this life? You know, people go on excessive holidays. You know, they buy excessive things to enjoy. You know, th like cars, clothing, mu music, whatever. People spending money traveling here to go to sporting events and concerts and whatever. Now, I'm not saying all of these things are wrong. That's not what I'm saying. But these are things, these are thorns. These can be thorns in your life, right? So there's nothing wrong with refresh and relaxation. But sometimes leaves on the tree can turn into thorns. Right? and become and make you unfruitful. So how does this manifest in our life, right? When, when we think about the thorns in our life, it's when people say things like, I'm too busy, you know? And too busy doesn't mean you don't have time. Too busy just means that you are not prioritizing the things you need to prioritize, right? Because we all have 24 hours in a day. So when you think, how does this manifest in my life when I have got too many thorns in my life? It's when you're too busy to make church a priority, you're too busy to make soul winning a priority, you're too busy to read your Bible, you're too busy to come to prayer meeting, you're too busy to do these things. Well, if you're too busy to serve God, you're too busy. Right? You need to cut some things out of your life so that you can do some things for God. Now, in other parables, I won't turn there, but see, this parable says they bring no fruit to perfection. What I find interesting in the other parables is it says they becometh unfruitful, which is interesting because if you become unfruitful, does that mean that you used to be fruitful? Because sometimes it's like that in, in church where people, they, you know, they get saved, they're, maybe they're a bit excited, they get into, you know, get into church, they're going soul winning, they're winning people to the Lord, but then the thorns come, it chokes the word, and they become unfruitful, because you know, they were once fruitful, but not anymore. Now this parable is not about church attendance, right? What's this parable? This parable is about bearing fruit, isn't it? So a lot of people think, well, you know, I'm still in church, but I don't go soul winning. You know, I must be on the good ground. No, 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 you're the thorny ground here. You know, because the, the good ground is trying to bear fruit, right? Going to church is not fruit bearing, right? Going to church is where you get sustenance, right? You're eating, right? This is where we eat, right? We eat food, we eat spiritual food, you have fellowship, you get recharged, you get that sustenance. But then you've got to use that sustenance to go do work. Right? So we have the work and we have the sustenance. So the parable is not about church attendance, it's about fruitfulness. So if you're thinking, you know, I'm in church, but I don't go soul winning, you, know, you are this thorny ground hero. You know, that, that's you. Now let's go on to the last one. This because this is what we want to be. This is what we're aiming towards. And as we think into the next year, we want to do even more of this, right? This is what we want to do more of as a church. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. You know, so the, the, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he that winneth souls is wise. You know, one main fruit that we bear as Christians is that we multiply ourselves, right? And we get more people saved. That's what our church ought to be like. And we see here on the good ground, they bring forth fruit with patience. Why? Because it's, it's not easy to get people saved. Right? It takes work. It takes a bit of patience. It's not patience. It's not just waiting for a long time. It's, it actually takes work to, you know, you have to, you have to put things, you have to make the time like we talked about. You have to make the time to go out soul winning. You have to go through the doors where people might not want to talk to you to get to the people that do want to talk to you. So it takes some patience, it takes some work. But eventually you'll see souls saved. And here it only mentions the hundredfold, but in, you know, in other parables it talks about the 30, the 60, 100 fold. So obviously we bear fruits in different amounts. So, you know, don't get caught up comparing yourself to others. Just make sure you do your best for the Lord. If you're doing your best for the Lord, trying to win as many souls to Christ, trying to preach the gospel as much as you can, then that's what you ought to be striving for. Because you can't control, you can't control the results, right? You know, you can only control how much work you do. You can only control how, much, how many doors you knock, how many how much time you invest, but you can't control that person's response, right? You know, you just need to find, you're just finding those people that are ready to hear and ready to listen to the gospel and ready to get saved. So we'll all be judged by what 
we have been given. It's not, we're not judged by in an absolute term, right? Because uh, there's different factors that make us more capable or less capable and whatnot. So this is what we're stri striving for. And, and this is, so, you know, thinking about, you know, in the last three years, people that have come and gone and people that are not as involved as they should be and people that are really involved, looking back, just thinking about this, this parable of the soul. But also, the thought I want to leave you with, that it, this is a reminder, this sermon is a reminder that this is what our church is about. Right? Our church is about winning souls. This is why we started it three years ago. This is why we continue to meet and continue to learn the Bible. It's we can go soul winning, right? And we can preach the gospel to more people. So this is what our church was about when it started. This is what it's still about. And I pray to God it will be what it's always about as it moves forward. So, you know, we celebrate three years of this church because it represents three years of soul winning and, and preaching the truth. And, and you know, we're excited as the church grows, not because, you know, honestly, it, I, I, I don't, you know, Alex asked me a couple of nights ago saying, you know, are you going to preach this, this stirring message? And I said to him, like, honestly, I don't think my sermons are that great. Like, I don't think my sermons are that great. I don't think I'm that much, that great of a leader, right? But, you know, what, what excites me about the church growing is not that I, you know, I want all these followers because we're going to get, we got more soul winners, right? It's more potential soul winners, more people, because, you know, we, we, like us as individuals, like me as an individual can only do so much. But then if people plug into this church and they catch the fire, they catch the vision, you know, they want to labor in the vineyard, they want to go soul winning, this is the place to be. This is where they'll get it, right? Because I, I see myself not as this great leader. I see myself as a facilitator. Like uh, to me, I'm just, you know, I've, I've just put the system in place to get people here so that we can encourage each other, right? Because I don't see myself as this great spearheaded, spearheaded leader. But if I can just get the system together, I can, you know, I can, you know, hey, I organize this place where people can meet. I organize some preaching. I organize the system to help us to go soul winning. Then that's just going to uh, make us more effective as a body. This is how I see myself serving the Lord. And I just find myself in this situation. Why? Because there was nobody else, right? I just, I just knew there was a need for churches, for soul winning churches in Australia. And that's why I heeded the call, right? Because God says, who's going to go? And I just said, here am I, send me. If I, can, if I can do it, I'll do it. So what will you accomplish for God a year from now? You know, when we sit, maybe in this room, maybe in another room, it doesn't really matter where we meet, but wherever we're sitting, you know, and we're watching our fourth year anniversary video, what story is that going to tell? You know, how are you going to help write that story so that when we're watching, it's like, hey, we can look back and say, praise God, you know, praise Jesus, this is what he has allowed us to do. How many more souls will be in heaven, you know, that you played a part in? You know, so that, like I said, when we watch that video next year, what's the story going to be? All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for uh, three great years. Uh, Lord, it's such a privilege and an honor to, to pastor your church. And I pray, Lord, that you give us all wisdom as we um, continue to strive to preach the gospel. Help us, Lord, um, to, to not grow cold in our love. Help us to have, you know, no, no love of the world in us so that we can maximize our love for you. So help us, Lord, help us not to be the, the, the rocky ground hearer or the stony heart, uh, the, the thorny heart hearer. Lord, help us to have that good and honest heart, a heart that prioritizes you, a heart that wanna, wants to work in your vineyard so that, Lord, that you can use us to be fruitful. I pray, Lord, that um, the Holy Spirit would speak to the people here. Lord, bring to remembrance things that they know that they can fix in their lives. I pray, Lord, that you give us the grace to do it. Uh, we pray you, pray, praise you, and we thank you in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.